the Indian Prime Minister, was among 13 Commonwealth heads of government staying at the hotel. The bomb killed two garbagemen and one policeman. In the aftermath of Australia's first terrorist bombing, at Sydney's Hilton Hotel in the 70s, a brand new police force burst onto the scene. These police officers are members of the newly formed Australian Federal Police. They're part of a section of the new force known as a Protective Service Unit. Well, that was a good entry. Now we lost one. What did you do wrong? They're training to be Australia's frontline troops in the war against international terrorism. You never know, that could happen any day. First man's entered the room, the second man's entered the room. The Australian Federal Police would become Australia's premier police force. But 29 years on, it's them in the firing line. In the wake of the Mohammed Hanif case, the AFP have found themselves derided as keystone cops, accused of incompetence, secrecy and playing politics. The pattern from the 1980s right through to Hanif is a culture of obsessive secrecy, the avoidance of accountability. Commissioner Kelty, at one time lauded as a public hero, has even faced calls to resign. I think Kelty's time is up and I think he should retire gracefully and if he doesn't, um, well then I think he should be sacked. Tonight on Four Corners, we examine the AFP's rise and its fall from grace and ask what went wrong. Was it simply one mishandled case, or do the Federal Police have serious problems that need to be addressed? Welcome back. Created in 1979, the AFP was a merger of the former Commonwealth Police and the ACT Police in Canberra with the Federal Narcotics Bureau thrown in. How good these people really are. Behind the show of bravado, it was a painful birth. It's chaotic. The organisations didn't know each other, they didn't like each other, they did, and they had no, no uh, sort of will to cooperate with each other. The faces belong to members of international terrorist organisations. The new force also inspired bitter and enduring hostility among state police who resented its greater powers such as phone tapping and its move into glamour crimes like terrorism, the drug trade and fraud. Well, their nickname back in those days was the Plastics. We referred to them as Plastics is because basically they were, they were incompetent. They weren't real police, they didn't engage in community-based policing. Everything had to be the biggest and the best and that brand name protection, that media and marketing aspect of their organisation where it was about style and it was never about substance. The AFP had its first brush with scandal when major corruption was uncovered inside the Sydney office that housed the Federal Police Drug Unit in the late 1980s. It's an episode that still rankles with some of those involved who say it set the pattern for much that has followed. Wayne Seavers was a member of the unit at the time. You had um, theft of drugs, you had people running with criminals, you had uh, prosecutions that um, were compromised, you had um, a range of corrupt activities. Mm. Superintendent Ray Cooper, now retired, was a commander in AFP internal investigations. He began an inquiry only to have it shut down and handed over to the Sydney office where corruption was endemic. I believe that the, 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 that purpose of one of the purposes of that group was to uh, was to uh, uh, get is to, is to discredit the informants and uh, and cover up the AFP's activities in Sydney. And was that the AFP's agenda, as you saw it? Well, I was to, I was told uh, by the commissioner and others that you know that don't don't make any trouble in Sydney because Sydney Drug Unit is the only drug unit that's, that's effective. Don't make any trouble in Sydney. We don't, we don't want to make any trouble in Sydney. The rot was left to fester until it erupted publicly several years later during the Wood Royal Commission into the New South Wales Police. 
The most recent allegations of systemic corruption came from former federal detective Alan Tashak, who claims a long-standing cell of corrupt federal detectives has been ignored. A separate inquiry was ordered into the AFP by a new federal government eager to squelch the scandal. It was conducted in private, its report never released. I thought it was wrong, very wrong. Um, I, I don't think the AFP can hold its head up about how it, how it can handle its own, well, in those days, how it can handle its own problems. Uh, covering it up, is, in my view, is not the answer. And hopefully that will lead to higher profile targeting. The officer in charge of implementing the inquiry's findings was Assistant Commissioner Mick Kelty, uh, the rising star of the force. Very good results out as a result of that. Kelty also won government plaudits for carriage of the much vaunted war on drugs. A graduate of the FBI Training Academy, he was one of a new breed of politically savvy professionals moving up the ranks. He was part of a group of people who I'd characterise who came up from Canberra, who, who were keen to reinvent themselves as anti-corruption busters, if you like. Um, they were smooth, they were slick, they were polished, and they were extremely ambitious people. And they were prepared to form the necessary relationships with politicians to get on in this world. I, Michael Joseph Kelty, do swear that I will be faithful and bear true allegiance... Mick Kelty was promoted to Commissioner in 2001. Successes according to law. He had cemented his reputation as a skilled investigator, a decent bloke and a canny political operator. I think from day one he was conscious that he needed to make sure he looked after the various stakeholders that were relevant to the AFP and the Prime Minister, the Prime Minister's office, were important stakeholders from his point of view. Kelty had been in the job only five months when the September 11 attacks on America took place, followed a year later by the Bali bombings. It's a terrible thing to say, but the Bali bombing occurred and that was a blessing for the AFP in that they were able to act quickly and professionally and everyone admired the way they responded to that uh, terrible event. Uh, the probably one of the worst um, terrorism events that have impacted on Australia. So, within about 27, 28 years, um, the, the AFP moved from being an object of derision to an object of, of admiration. Federal Police Commissioner Mick Kelty asserts... The AFP's work in Indonesia won universal praise. And in the short term, Most of the bombers were soon caught, and a string of further attacks was just as quickly solved. Commissioner Kelty was fated around the world, while a grateful nation rewarded the force with virtually whatever it wanted. The AFP was able to reposition itself as the premier intelligence fighting agency and that meant massive injections of money, capital and a very close uh, relationship with the government. In the years since September 11, under the banner of the war on terror, the AFP has undergone enormous growth. Its staff numbers have more than doubled, while its budget has quadrupled to almost $1.8 billion a year. It now operates in 33 countries and spends the bulk of its budget on national security and overseas deployments. The question I ask is whether we've done this at the expense of the AFP's core budget, whether they've taken their eyes off uh, major issues such as drug trafficking, um, financial crime, um, um, issues such as uh, child sex tourism, these kind of issues which the AFP saw as its main work four or five years ago and which apparently now is not its core business. 
Former chairman of the National Crime Authority, John Broom, says the shift is reflected in a dramatic drop in the number of criminals charged by the AFP. Cases sent to the DPP for prosecution have fallen by half, from more than 1,000 to around 500 a year. And despite the AFP's massive expansion, John Broom says there's been a fall in its expertise. We've seen both a growth in the number of, of AFP personnel with less than five years' experience and a reduction, at least in percentage terms, of those with, say, more than 15 years of experience. So we've lost some of the old heads, the wise heads, and we've seen them replaced with large numbers of relatively untried people. Hello. Now I hope the food here is going to be AFP veteran Wayne Seavers left the force eight years ago to pursue a career in politics. Good evening and thank you all very much for coming here tonight. Uh, I'll just slip my He's now an outspoken so. critic of the Federal Police. Put simply, the lives of ordinary Australians are adversely affected, sometimes quite profoundly, when the powerful and the arrogant are unaccountable. The Australian Federal Police is one case in point. Back in 1999, Seavers was in East Timor serving with the United Nations when he received intelligence that military-backed militias opposed to independence were planning a massacre. The warnings were ignored by Australian authorities and a bloodbath ensued. Seavers and his AFP colleagues earned a group citation for bravery during the turmoil. We're here to do our job and we'll carry on. He later went public to criticise the authorities for failing to stop the slaughter. As a result, he was targeted for investigation for unlawful disclosure of Commonwealth information, causing him to resign in 2000. I understood then that our organisation was well and truly on the road to being political that it was not giving the fearless and frank advice, that it was working in effect to look after the government's image. Mm -hmm. Wayne Seavers is not alone in holding this view. It's a concern that's shared by many working police. Uh, there is a concern that the broader public perceive uh, the AFP to have been manipulated, that some in the broader public perceive that. That is a concern to us because everything we do, the most important thing to us, is the trust of the public. Since the advent of the war on terror, policing has become highly politically charged. This was starkly illustrated in the wake of the Al-Qaeda train bombings in Madrid in March 2004. If this turns out to be Islamic extremists responsible for this bombing in Spain, it's more likely to be linked to the position that Spain and, and other allies took uh, in, on issues such as Iraq. This seemingly simple observation by Commissioner Kelty provoked a political storm because it was at odds with the government's view and implied that Australia too could become a target because of its support for the war in Iraq. I'd seen the interview and uh, I rang the, the Prime Minister about it because I said, I think this is going to cause us a problem. I spoke to the PM about that and uh, he said, well, ring Mick and let him know that I'm very concerned about this because, uh, you know, the way it could be interpreted, etc. Kelty came under withering attack, including this from the then Foreign Minister Alexander Downer is just expressing, um, expressing a view which um, reflects a lot of the propaganda we're getting from Al-Qaeda. After two days of it, both Kelty and the government had had enough. Well, it had been agreed on the, the Sunday that if things got to a point where they needed to be clarified, well, there'd have to be some form of clarification. Uh, there were a total of 202. Kelty's statement of clarification said he'd been taken out of context and echoed the government's line.